So welcome everyone to second topic that we're covering, so recording transactions. Um, this is an important topic to set the scene in terms of the process of what we need to go through for the next few weeks. And look, there is an element to this which when we go through it and you look at it and you're like, this is about process and process, um, you know, you could argue is not necessarily the most exciting of things to do, um, but it is actually a really important thing because once we understand how we get from point A to point B and that process is going along, you can see how important the accountant's role, how important judgment is, how decisions that get made can have major impacts in terms of how financial reports look um, and how easy it is for those things to take place. So in this lecture, we'll cover the steps in the accounting cycle and describe the purpose of an accounting information system. Um, we'll look at accounting transactions and what their impact is on the accounting equation. Now this step, the analyzing the effect of accounting transactions is really important. This idea that you have some sort of event take place and then somebody has to look at it and go, well, what does this actually mean? That's that's that point where changes can be made, or not even changes necessarily. It could be choices that are made to, to, account, for, to account for it as one thing versus another can have really big, really big consequences down the line. Uh, we'll look at T accounts and debits and credits. I know a lot of people have views on these things, but um, they are really important. They are useful to look at how they work. Um, and they do make your life a lot easier. And especially for those that are going on to do um, further accounting, so whether it be financial reporting analysis or corporate accounting, that stuff is really important. Um, describe the purpose of the accounting journal, ledger and trial balance. This is part of this process. So I, as we go through the slide deck that you guys have. I probably won't go through every single slide in detail. Some of them can be used as background for when you're looking at this stuff because I generally don't like to be, you know, I use them as a structure, but I also like to talk about things in a bit more of a holistic fashion and I think it's useful to be able to do that, but they are useful to be able to look back on and see how it relates to what we're talking about. Uh, so describe the purpose of the journal, the ledger and the trial balance. And lastly, record and post accounting transactions and prepare a trial balance and financial statements. So we're gonna learn basically what the process is and then we're gonna go through it. Now for today, for the rest of this afternoon, I'll be the one stepping through that particular process. But down the line next week, it'll be you guys doing it. When it comes to sort of assessments, it'll be you guys doing it. So obviously, you know, I can sit here and do it. It's ultimately you guys are the ones who will have to be able to, to walk through it. Now to start with, the accounting information system. An accounting information system is about recording information to produce financial statements. So if we remember back to even, well to last week, but also to earlier today. By the end of this course, you should be like, when you ever see a building like this drawn up, you know that that's just like stuff going on. That's what it represents. It represents business activities. Um, anyway, so that's economic event things happening. And ultimately what we want to get is some sort of financial statements out the back end of that. Now, for external financial reporting, uh, for financial accounting, those external accounting statements will be your general purpose financial reports, your balance sheet, your profit and loss, they get put in your annual report and they get you know, made public. Accounting information systems also provide internal reporting. Um, so there's a lot of internal reporting that we get at this organisation about things which are important for, for what we're doing, which are not for external broadcasts. And that would be the same in any organization. Um, there are probably things which you do in your own personal lives in terms of some people record their own sort of finances more detailed than others. That's not for external broadcasts. That's for you to be able to make your decisions on what you want to spend your money on. Um, 
however you do it, the, the information system could be really complicated. It could be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. Um, that system takes these things which have happened and creates financial statements out the other side. Now there are steps in that process and we're gonna walk through those steps over the next couple of weeks. We're gonna do some of them now. Um, so the first step along this process is we're gonna analyze the transaction and in a few moments time we'll deal with the journal entry but we have some sort of transaction. We have some sort of record of what actually happened. So that gets dealt with. Once we've done that, it gets put into it gets posted to an account. So we go, here's a transaction and then it needs to get put somewhere. And I'll use an analogy which is hopefully one which you're familiar with in a moment. Once you've got it in the accounts, and these could be anywhere from 10, you know, 10 accounts to hundreds. Once you've got all these accounts, everything's in there, then you create the trial balance. Once you've got the trial balance, realistically, we can create financial statements from that. And that's actually exactly what we're gonna be doing today. Um, so journalizing and post accounting transactions actually relates to both of these things. Prepare a trial balance is the second step listed up there. Um, now, technically, we're actually also doing, we say cover steps one and two. This step, we're actually is step five. So we're actually doing steps one, two, and step five that are listed up there. What we're not doing is Steps three and four, which actually happen in here, where we've got these adjustments which take place, and we'll end up with an adjusted trial balance. And then that goes up. So that's, that's next week. So we're doing the, the main process today, and then we, we look at what these adjustments are next week. And they're very important that we do make these adjustments. Prepare the financial statements. And then we have next week, oh, I'll run out of room, closing entries. So this week is in the blue. Something happens, we do the journal entry for it, we post it to the account, we create a trial balance, we put it into the financial statements. Next week, we take these adjustments, we deal with these adjustments, create an adjusted trial balance, get the financial statements, and then we need to just tidy up a few things at the end. That's the next two weeks. Um, and as I will go through, especially as we go through some of the, the numerical, the, the problem today, I can point out, yes, there's a process, but there's also some really important reasons why we understand this process because where accounting manipulations or things can go a bit awry, knowing the process helps you understand how it happens and also how it flows through the system. So a company's accounting information system identifies, records, summarizes, and communicates the various transactions of a company. Um, these could be really simple. Um, you could have, if you don't have many transactions at all, an Excel spreadsheet is, could be an accounting information system. Um, you know, I have a business and it, doesn't have many transactions at all. Has a few, you know, has a few contracts every so often. I don't need anything more complicated than Excel spreadsheet to do that. It's just pure consulting work. So it's no, I don't have assets, I don't have liabilities, I don't have anything like that. It's just, as I do a job, I just record the fact that I've done a job. But then you think about someone like Woolworths who sell $58 billion worth of product every year, that sell over a billion dollars worth of product every week they need something a little bit more complicated. And there's obviously a range of things in between those two types of businesses. Um, but ultimately what they're doing is, a lot of it's at this end. If you think about 
a lot of this, the smaller sort of packages which are available, things through Zero, things through Myob, all of those kind of online accounting packages. Once you put the information in, this stuff kind of comes out on automatically at the end. So it's a very automated system nowadays. The reason why we're going through it is so you can better understand actually how it goes from here to there. Um, so accounting transactions are economic events that affect a company's assets, liabilities, or equity at the time of the event. So when I get paid, that's an economic event for the university. They have less cash and they've incurred an expense. When I send an email to a colleague, that's not an economic event. I don't think any email, like email providers and whatnot charge you per email, it's just a general thing. So that email, that's, that's an event, and it could be a really important event. If I sent a nasty email to someone, that could be a pretty important thing. But it's not an economic event in this sense. So not everything which happens is an economic event. Uh, the key components, so examples of transactions, and look, we've seen a bunch of transactions, we will continue to see transactions. Um, so anything which affects a specific account is going to be an accounting transaction. Now what we end up with is, and if you think about the journal entries that, that happen, so if we have transactions, now I want the best way to conceptualize this in a, in, a, in a sense where you guys have a lived experience of this, is think about your bank account. You may have multiple bank accounts, but think about just one of them where you've got transactions coming in or out. Um, if you don't want to think about a bank account, think about if you've got a credit card, same, works much the same. So if you think about a bank account, if you get it, if you get the old, I still get my paper copies, I'm just bit of a Luddite in that respect. So, you know, I get my bank account and you check it and it's got, you know, all the transactions that happen throughout. And that's kind of like these. There'll be kind of, you know, January 1, January 2, January 4, January 10, January, you know, whatever. There'll just be a list of transactions that take place. And that's useful. I can see stuff coming in or out. I check that stuff because from time to time there have been fraudulent transactions, especially my credit cards, and you just need to check that you're not getting done over by someone. But if you're thinking about your bank account, what piece of information is actually really useful for you? What's one of the key things you look at when you check out your bank account? Someone said it? Puka? Yeah, the balance. Why do you want it? Why, you know, when you get money out of the ATM, whether you print it or you have it up on screen, you, you generally check the balance. Why do we want to know the balance when we look at our bank account? Yeah, I want to know how much money I've got. Just so I'm not going to, you know, I've got enough, I know I've got enough money to pay for stuff if I need it. Everyone, what you do want to know, that's probably the most critical thing when you're looking at your bank account is the bank balance. Um, that's, that's a bank account. It accumulates all those transactions, puts it in one place so you can actually get a sense of what the balance is. Journal entries is the listings, and then the account is actually where they all end up. Um, now, a chart of accounts is, from a, from a web point of view, if you're thinking about websites, if you look at a site map, a site map, if websites still have them, many don't, but a site map lets you check out all the different pages which are there, so you can understand where stuff is. A chart of accounts is much the same. It's just kind of that overview of what all the different accounts are. Um, in this case, the assets are in the hundreds, the liabilities 200s, equity 300s, and so on. Um, with one of the organizations I do some work with, I had to add a couple of accounts yesterday into the chart of accounts just because we were doing a few different things. Um, the cash accounts, the bank accounts, all start with 700s. They're just I didn't set it up, that's just how they were. And then so when I've added a few, I've just added in, found, literally just found a number which was available and then just created a new account. Um, they're just so you can navigate in. You would have sub accounts within them because if you look at account 400, service revenue, that's pretty high level. But you may have service revenue from, if you're thinking about Woolworths, service revenue from, or sales revenue from groceries, sales revenue from service stations, sales revenues from masters, you know, all these different things. So you want to be able to get that to figure out all the different stuff which is going on. All right. 
So analyzing the effect of accounting transactions on the accounting equation. Now, accounting is double entry. There are two things, at least two things which go on. That's good because it allows a cross check to make sure that things are working the way they are. It also allows you to see sort of where something has come from and what it's been used for. Now, we've got this accounting equation, assets equals liability plus equity. That has to remain in balance every step of the way. So that means that every single transaction which takes place has to meet that criteria of that balancing. So if the left hand side goes up in, on a net basis, this side has to go up on a net basis. You could have something where assets go up and assets go down, so it cancels out. So that's okay, it doesn't have to be on both sides. But every transaction, that has got to be satisfied. Um, which is what we've got there. So what I have is, this is an example. Um, all this information is obviously in, in the slides that you've got. It's also in a handout document which is available um, online, so you should have one or the other. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the slide, I'm going to keep the information up on one of the screens up the front, and then I'm going to work off it off the other two screens. So the information will be visible in front of you um, if you don't happen to have it with you right now. Um, so what you see here is 10 transactions from the start of a business where the company put money into this particular, or the investors put money into this particular business for cash, down to wages being paid. Oh, no, sorry, dividends. Dividends being paid right at the bottom. So 10 transactions and what we're going to do is step through um, how to work this using this setup. So in a sense, we've just taken this basic accounting equation, assets equals liabilities plus equity, and just added a few, added a few asset accounts, added a couple of liability accounts, and added it, and made it two equity accounts. Now, uh, right, I'll just bring up. All right, <clears throat> and I'll just walk, and we'll walk through it together. And obviously, the idea being, you know, you have a look at it, see what you think. Okay, so in transaction one, um, after incorporating, oh no, hang on, I've got it on every slide, uh, main wall, side wall. weird. Um, that's really weird. Why is that not? Alright, well we can see what, we've lost a bit of visibility off, off that, but we can see what we need to see. Um, so this is transaction one, which is um, transaction one, funnily enough. So after incorporating Circle Films issues 3,000 shares to investors of $15,000 in cash. Um, cash goes up, so we recognize cash existing in the account. And because it's for the owners, and it represents the owner's stake in the business, that's capital increasing by $15,000. Again, assets equals liabilities plus equity, both sides. Um, for two, Circle purchases a video camera for 9,000 and memory cards for 1,000. Now, the video camera for nine is equipment. Is 9,000. The memory cards we've called supplies. Look, you may be able to argue the fact that they're equipment, but look, it's an asset. It's an asset for the purposes of right here and now. Doesn't change it too much. So we've got $10,000 in increase in assets and we paid cash for it. So the cash asset has decreased by $10,000.
in three, Circle receives a $1,500 payment. So bless you. Bless you. Any more? No? All right, I'll leave that be. Um, Circle receives a $1,500 payment immediately after filming a customer's wedding. So we break this up into two bits at this point in time. We know cash has come in, so we can show that there's been an increase in cash. What else has happened? What else has happened is we have done some work. So because we've done some work, that is going to be an, an overall equity effect because that would be a revenue item and that would ultimately lead into retained earnings. So we see retained earnings increase by 1500. Now four is similar in some respects, but slightly different. So four, we receive money. So in four, Circle receives a $2,000 deposit. So we see cash increase in both of these. But where it's different is in four, we haven't done the work yet. So we can't show anything over in retained earnings because we haven't actually done revenue. We can't record, we can't get an equity effect. What we have is, is unearned revenue. And it's unearned because we haven't done the work yet, just like the name suggests. And it's a liability, and unearned revenue is a liability because what a liability is, is an obligation. And we have an obligation, or this company has an obligation to perform um, this filming service for this wedding, or for this, for this anniversary. It's exactly the same reason why Qantas has a huge amount of unearned revenue liabilities in its balance sheet because it gets a huge amount of money from paying passengers prior to them flying. So it has an obligation to them to provide them flights sometime in the future. Uh, for five, Circle paid $250 cash to run an ad in the local paper. So they paid cash, so cash has gone down by $250. Whilst we're not told exactly, we're making the assumption that the ad runs right now. If it's running right now, it's an, ex excuse me, it's an expense and we show it as a reduction in retained earnings. Um, if it was to be run in the future, then you would do something different with it and we'll see what we would do next week. Uh, Circle, Circle films a dance competition leaving a $3,500 invoice with the customer. Now, what they've done, there's no cash moving, so cash doesn't get affected here. What they do with retained earnings is there is revenue because they have done the work, but they don't get cash because they haven't actually received it yet. So as I heard someone sort of whispering out there, it does go to accounts receivable. Somebody owes you money. Uh, the next one, Circle purchases another $9,000 video camera by signing a nine month promissory note requiring, come down, requiring, requiring the payment of principal and interest at maturity. So equipment has gone up. The cash to buy the camera never came to them. There's no cash movement there. They literally just walked away with a piece of equipment um, and said they would pay principal and interest at maturity. Um, so that is notes payable. And look, and a, a quick comment on that, you'll see that the note payable, even though you could argue, yes, it's, it's debt and debt's a bad thing if you want to think about it that way, um, but it's not a negative amount in there, it's a positive, it's showing that the liability is increasing. Um, so they've walked away with some equipment, the assets have increased, cash hasn't been touched, and they have a liability. Now. On a side note, and I don't know if you saw this article, but there was an article yesterday about, um, there's a company in Australia called Radio Rentals um, that they do like a, you, you can rent things like furniture and household goods, and they had an offer where you could rent things and then buy them outright at the end of the, t at the, end of the rental agreement for a dollar. Now it turns out that's not quite what they did. And the case they had, a, a, a lady started a class action up against them, so she's taken them to court. 
she has so far paid and she hasn't bought it outright yet something like three and a half thousand dollars for a bed with a value of about 400 and she still doesn't own the bed yet so and you know that's obviously in, in relation to she's walked away with an asset and she has a liability sitting against it and the liability has never been extinguished because the interest keeps rolling up you know i think that's criminal but just my, my two cents on it. I just, I don't understand how people can get away with that. Um, eight, Circle receives $3,500 from the customer in payment of the invoice from transaction six. So cash has come in. We have $3,500 cash increase in the bank account. Exactly, account receivable has gone because we see a reduction in the account receivable because that person has now paid us. No one owes us any money anymore. Uh, for nine, Circle pays wages, so pays wages, so cash drops by 2,000 and it's an expense of 2,000 because we're assuming this is for work that has been done and so in that particular period. At the end of the month, Circle pays its owner a $1,500 cash dividend. So that's cash going out. And it's an impact on retained earnings because retained earnings get, sorry, dividends get paid out of retained earnings. So I'll just unclear all of these. And so when you add these all up, and again, you have this document. This document is available for you. So with all the formatting and with all the, the formula in play so you can see how it works. Um, cash, the ending balance is 8,250. The accounts receivable is zero. The supplies is 1,000. Equipment, 18,000. Unearned revenue, 2,000. Notes payable, 9,000. Capital, 15,000. Retained earnings, 1,250. When you add up all the assets, it equals 27,250. When you add up the liabilities, it's 11,000. When you add up the equity, it's 16,250. Liabilities plus equity equals 27,250, which is great as an accountant. I'm excited by that because it balances. Life is good. Who cares about the rain? We've got a balance sheet which balances. Um, so that's what you're looking for in this. Every line balanced which means if every line individually balances means the whole thing balances and we have a balanced balance sheet perfect Oop, wrong one hang on what am i doing um so same information just looks slightly different okay so that's one way to do things and it's not quite the way that we actually do them in practice. Um, what we have are these things called journal entries and what we have then are things called T accounts which the information from the journal entries goes into the T accounts. Now to do this we need to introduce what are known as debits and credits and everyone hears this and it's like oh Debits and credits, this is why I hear bad things about accounting. So debits and credits, it's actually not that difficult, but I understand there's a reason why people have so much trouble with it. Debits and credits literally just mean left and right. Nothing about increases or decreases, nothing at all about that, it's just left and right. So I'm gonna jump ahead, I'm gonna probably change in the future the, the order of these slides around a little bit. What you have with an account It's a T account. Now I'm pretty sure you can all see why we call it a T account. So that's a T account. The debit is literally when you have something happening on that side. The credit is when you have something happening on that side. That's it. Where people get unstuck with is when it relates to cash and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. So we've got an account here now debit could mean an increase, it could mean a decrease, it depends on the account. Same for credits. So we need a, a way to figure out what happens which way. 
So for asset accounts, when you have an increase, when you increase cash or increase buildings or increase accounts receivable, it happens on this side. When you increase equity, when you incre increase um, revenues, when you increase accounts payable, you increase it with a credit, you increase it on the right hand side. Decreases are flipped. So assets are decreased with credits, liabilities and equity are decreased with debits. Now, that is just the system. So there's an element of you just gonna have to deal with the fact that you're gonna have to remember this stuff. One way is not a bad way to remember it is how to deal with increases. Assets, when they're increased, increase with debits. Debits are on the left, assets are on the left-hand side of the accounting equation. So when, you have, when you're dealing with increases, just follow the accounting equation. Assets increase with a debit, assets are on the left. Liabilities and equity increase with credits, liabilities and equity are on the right. Once you've got that worked out, everything else actually flows off quite nicely from it. So whenever you have cash increasing, and cash features in a lot of different situations, and so really remember what you do with cash, and if we go back to the example, look at how many transactions cash was involved here. Cash was involved in nearly all of them. So if you remember what you do with cash when it increases, worst case, you know what the other side is because it's just gotta be the other side. Um, so you can remember this, and I struggle to remember it like, or you could remember one part of it, which is when assets increase, they do it with that. Remember that one thing and everything else works off it. Because if it's increased with that, a decrease has to be the opposite. So that's easy. If you increase it with a credit, with, so if you increase with a debit, liabilities and equity just do the opposite because they're on the opposite side of the equation. So where this is a debit, those two are credits. That just flips. Um, revenue does the same thing as equity. Because when owners, what equity represents is the owner's wealth. Owners want their wealth increasing. If they were to tip more money in, the equity in the business would increase. When they earn revenue, that increases their equity. So that makes their wealth increase. So revenue does the same thing as equity in terms of it's a credit increase, which means expenses do the opposite. They do, they increase with the debit. And dividends decrease the equity in the business because it's actually taking the equity out and basically sending it back to the owners. So that's probably the key one. At least, look, that's the way I remember this sort of stuff. Remember one and then just realize and just work the logic around the rest of them. Um, but there is a, I suppose with it, the problem a lot of people have from a conceptual point of view with debits and credits, especially if you, you're really new to accounting and it's not something that um, you paid a lot of attention to is when you look at your bank statements. Because what we're gonna be dealing with here is when, when you have cash increasing, you have it as a debit. But when you look at your bank statements, if you've got money in your account or if you've got money coming into your account, what happens? If you've got money in your account, is it a debit balance or is it a credit balance? Yeah, it's a credit balance. When you have money get put into your account, your account is credited. So what you have been looking at for the past however many years with your bank accounts, which you have you know, spent a lot longer with than with this, you've always seen cash increasing as a credit because that's what you see with your bank accounts. Now the reason that's the case, and that's not wrong what's happening there, there's, there's a really good reason for it and you may well be aware of it. The reason it's it happens like that is because the accounts are not written from your perspective. The accounts are written from the bank's perspective. From the bank's perspective, they owe you money. You, are, you have lent money to the bank. That's what, it's not like in the bank there's a little, unless you've got a safe deposit box, which is something, a completely different thing. 
it's like when your money, when you see your account balance, it's not like there's this little pile of money, little pile of notes sitting there, which is yours, and then you get to sort of take away whenever you want. That's not what it represents. It just represents that's how much the bank owes you. If you look at a bank's balance sheet, you'll see in the liabilities, there'll be deposits there because that represents that they owe you cash. So that's, that's a lot of the confusion that resides around debits and credits is because whenever you come across a debit or a credit in your life, generally speaking, it's the opposite to what we're talking about. But there's a reason for that. Um, so anyway, it's however you learn it, whether it's through this, whether it's through this, you just got to deal with it, got to learn it. Um, and for adjusting entries next week and the next couple of weeks, you need to sort of get on top of it pretty quick because next week will be quite difficult if you're not relatively sort of happy with how this stuff works. So now that we've got this T account, <clears throat> when a transaction takes place, what we have is this journal entry. So this is a double sort of double element to it. So we have debit account and we have credit and account and the amounts involved. Now I'll talk about the setting out because there are some important elements of setting out which would normally we're fairly not too fussed by things. The setting out for these is actually quite important. Um, but if you're making notes, and I see some people just sort of just letting it wash over them, two really critical things happen at this juncture because once you've made this entry, and we'll see this in, in practice in a moment, once this has happened, this is automatic. This just, this just flows mechanically from whatever you did here. This just flows mechanically from whatever you did here. This is just an, an automatic process. If we go from here to here, assuming you've tagged that you know, cash is an asset account and a, and a loan is a liability account, as long as you've identified the accounts properly, that's an automatic process. So as soon as you put something in here, you get a, you get a financial statement coming out the other side. Where things happen and where you can change how a company looks if we're not just making stuff up. We could just falsify stuff, and that's a completely different thing. But it's at this point around the judgments that get made here that things can be made to look different ways. Because there are two elements to this. There's the account that you choose. Now, in some cases, that's going to be pretty obvious. Like if you've got cash moving around, cash is going to be one of those accounts but it's not always going to be obvious and we're going to look at a couple of cases where it's not. The amount that you use is also not necessarily obvious. Um, and whilst today that's not so much of an issue, I think next week we'll start to see where it can become more of an issue. So what account you choose and what amount. <clears throat> what we're going to do at this point is because this talks about the next step in the process going from here to here, let's actually go back to that example. We've got it still sitting on the board. Let's go back to that example and let's do all the journal entries for it um, and see what we're looking at. All right, so the first transaction we have is after incorporating Circle Films issues 3,000 shares to investors for $15,000 in cash. Now, as we go through this, again, you've got this information. We have cash increasing in the business. Cash is an asset. That means we debit the asset. We already told 15,000. We have equity increasing because the owners, the contributed capital or just the capital amount is increasing. We credit capital 15,000. That's the owner's investment in the business. Now, so a couple of comments while we've got this in front of us around setup. The first bit is having some sort of reference. It's always good practice and in reality, this will happen, um, be coded up in some way. So we know what transaction we're referring to. It could be a date transaction, it could be alphanumeric, it could be just one. Um, the second bit is <clears throat> underneath, we have a narration about what the transaction was. 
good practice to, to include narration in there. Um, whether or not you need to in any sort of assessment with us, we'll advise you on that, but it's good practices to get into the habit. The account name, this is something we are quite pedantic on, debits first. Debit, then credit. Debit first, then credit. You'll see that the credit is offset slightly. Do that. It doesn't have to be offset so it's in a completely different column, but offset it slightly so have that small indent. Um, if you wanted to do it as debit cash, credit contributed capital, that's fine as well. Um, whatever sort of suits you fancy. That probably makes it much clearer exactly what you're doing. So I'd, I would suggest that's probably a good way to do it, but it's you know, really up to you. Um, the other thing which is really good practice to do, and it actually helps you much more than it helps us, um, but it is useful for us as well, is you'll see that these are indented as well. So we've got the debits on the left, the credits on the right, but we put them in two completely separate columns. We don't have it debit and then a little bit pushed across still underneath it credit because that'll get confusing for you if you're dealing with a whole page of them and then you're trying to figure out what's a debit, what's a credit. Keep it really clearly debit then credit, two separate columns. It makes your life much, much easier. Um, and then figuring out which accounts. We've got cash going up, which is an asset, debit, equity going up, contributed capital, that's a credit. Uh, so item two is purchases a video camera for 9,000 and memory cards for 1,000. The equipment is an asset, it's debited 9,000. Supplies is an asset, it's an increase, debit 1,000. Cash is decreasing, it's a credit 10,000. No net effect on the balance sheet, it's no net effect, it's just assets have gone up by 10, assets have gone down by 10. Three, Circle receives a $1,500 payment immediately after filming a customer's wedding. Debit cash, because cash has been received, $1,500. Credit service revenue, it's a revenue account. Revenues are increased by credits. Excuse me, credit service revenue, $1,500. In four, you receive cash but haven't done the work yet. Debit cash, $2,000. Credit unearned revenue, 2000. This is a liability, a liability increases with a credit. And again, I realize this is, you know, we've got 10 of these to go through and it's, but it is useful just to get into the rhythm of how this stuff works. Cause we're gonna take this right through from these into the transact, into the actual financial statements themselves. Four, oh sorry, five, advertising expense. Okay, so five is we paid cash to run an ad. Credit cash, 250, cash has gone out and it's an expense. So debit, advertising expense, 250. Expenses happen with debits. So when you have an increase in expense or an expense happening, it's a debit. Six, halfway there, a little bit over halfway there. Six, Circle films a dance competition leaving a three and a half thousand dollar invoice with the customer. We have an asset increasing, but it's not cash. We have an asset because someone owes us money. So debit accounts receivable, three and a half thousand dollars. We've done the work. So credit service revenue, three and a half thousand dollars. In seven, we purchase that video camera and we don't pay for it. We just take on a note that we have to repay in the future. We have an asset equipment increasing by 9,000. We have a liability because we now owe at this point, 9,000, um, and we credit 9,000. So there's a few things I've got to come back to with this because there's some interesting kind of comments that we can make around these. Um, debit cash, person finally, person paid us. Debit cash, three and a half thousand, which is an asset. We have an asset reducing three and a half thousand credit accounts receivable, three and a half thousand. Assets net haven't changed. We've just swapped one asset for another. 
Debit wages expense, 2,000, because we've incurred an expense in relation to employees. Credit cash, 2,000, because we have paid those employees and the cash asset is reducing, therefore it's a credit. And to wrap things up, we made it. If you're not too sure what dividends is, in terms of if it's a debit or credit, and that's, that's you're not gonna see a lot of transaction including dividends, so that's quite possible to be the case. This is why remembering what you do with cash is a really important one. So we know cash is an asset. When cash reduces, it's a credit. We read this example and it talks about that a cash dividend has been paid, which means cash is going out. Cash is going out, it's a credit. So at worst, you're gonna have transaction 10, credit cash 1500, debit something we don't know, 1500, because you need something there and we've paid dividends to owners. So at worst, you've missed one little piece of information. And you go, well, what seems to be a reasonable name to call this account? Well, it's dealing with dividends. Let's just call it dividends. Um, so really remember what you do with cash. That, I know we got there and we got there in the end. That is that process. Now, the reason it's important to have gone through this um, is because we can then look at what we've done and we can illuminate a couple of key points with it. And the first thing I want to do is to look at transaction six and transaction eight. Okay. So if we look at those two combined, there's a couple of interesting aspects of this that we can look at. We've got debit account receivable credit service revenue, debit cash, credit account receivable. This relates to the same account receivable. You can see the amounts are the same. If we were to take those two transactions combined, what you see happen is accounts receivable, accounts receivable, debit, credit, they net out. So in a sense, this, this and this disappear and what we're left with is debit cash, credit service revenue. So what we're left with in, in the net situation is what we've got there, debit, cash, credit, service, revenue. All that we've done, so the same effect takes place, it just gets split. So in here, it's we've done the work, we've received the money. Now if you look at this, this is, and it's an important thing to note, this is where the profit and loss effect takes place. This, there is, n even though you've got money coming in, there is no profit and loss effect at that point. That's an asset and that's an asset. So that's not affecting profit and loss. Profit and loss is driven by when you do the work. And I'm gonna keep stress, I mean, it may seem like a broken record, but I will keep stressing that because it is such an important feature of the system. Um, so that's one thing, is that those two things effectively net out. The second is this transaction. Okay, so we look at advertising expense and cash. So I've been talking for a fair bit. I'm not expecting a lot of talking, but I want you guys to think about it. Um, and if someone wants to offer a response, that'd be good. Let's imagine entry five never happened. Let's imagine we just make that disappear. If we make that disappear, will our profit be higher or will it be lower? It'll be higher. It'll be higher, why will it be higher? There's an expense we're taking off, but cash is not affected. Okay, holding the cash comment, the first bit, bang on. There is an expense. The profit and loss impact on transaction five is the expense. It's not the cash movement. That's, a, that's not the expense. The expense is the profit and loss impact. So if transaction five was made to disappear, our profit would be higher. Everyone, everyone would agree with that? Cool. Do you think, so let's work on the basis that that cash payment actually did happen. 
you can see it in the bank, you could see there's a transaction, $250 has gone out. So do you think we would be able to make that transaction disappear? Do you think we could get away with that? No. Do you think if an auditor looked at that and went, hang on, they look at your bank account and say, what's this $250 for? So we couldn't just make it disappear. We couldn't just delete that transaction. We can see there'd be benefit for deleting it because it would make our profit look higher. Yes, we've spent the cash, but our profit would look higher. And if people are looking at our profit and loss statement to make a decision of whether or not to invest with us, that could be important. So hopefully everyone sort of is, is getting where I'm going with this. So we probably wouldn't want that expense if we could get away with it, but we can't make it disappear because cash is gone and there is a trail that people can see. So what you could do is maybe your boss comes up and says, well, we're, so we're paying for this advertising, cash is actually going out. That's true, we can see that. But this is, helping build us, this is helping us build our brand. This is helping us get our name out into the market and so people are more likely to come and get services with us. This is a brand development exercise. So let's call it what it is. This is, this is an investment in our brand. This is an asset, this isn't an expense. We're gonna debit brand name, asset, credit, cash. Is there a profit and loss effect from that transaction now? No. Have we had to lie about cash moving? No. Have we got the profit and loss effect out of the system that we wanted so we make our profit look higher? Absolutely. This is why accounting choices matter because you're not changing the underlying cash movement, you're not changing the underlying those things, you're just changing how something is called, you're changing how it's classified. Now. Legally now, you can't do that. Like that's, what I've just done there is not actually possible. A while ago it used to be, but it's got stopped because for this very reason. So we're not allowed to do that. But there are other places you can do these sort of things. And it's sometimes it can be kind of iffy, whether it's this thing or it's that thing. Um, so if you think about a car, like is a repair to your car, if you're getting if you're getting new tires, is that a repair and should be expensed or is that part of the asset and you should just be making it as part of the asset? That will then make your financials look quite different. And so it's not always cut and dried what you do. Um, so that was the second thing I wanted to point out was, so the first thing was about the difference between cash movement and revenue. The second thing was about classification of accounts. The third thing I want to talk about was amounts. I'll pick a color. Okay. So the equipment's come on at 9,000. The note payable, the liability is 9,000. But we're not going to pay 9,000. By the time we repay this, it's not going to be 9,000. So Sometimes it could be, well, shouldn't we show how much it's going to actually be at that point in time? But you don't. The note payable is 9,000 because at the point of time that you took it out, you only owed 9,000. If you were able to suddenly, if you won the lottery and suddenly had a lot of money and paid them back right then, you'd only have to pay them 9,000. So that's, it's probably not the, there's no real good examples in this. That's probably the best of them in relation to the number. When you finally pay them, you might have to pay them $10,000. Now, we have to figure out how to change that account to do that. Um, but we'll look at that and some of the, the, the numerical issues over, the, over next week. Um, but as you're starting to see, it's this, all of this, this is where all the action happens. Because once you've got this done, this bit's really easy. And because we're about to do it, and you'll see it's actually not a lot going on with it. So after a transaction is journalized, that's what we've just done. We then take all of that information and we put it in 
to the debit and credit columns of the T account. So we would be starting to add this stuff in as we have the transactions for them. Now this used to happen and, and just cast, I suppose, spare a thought for the people that have to do this. This used to all be done by hand. If you go back, if you read that reading I gave you for the start of the semester on the reckoning, um, they talk about these sort of things back in, in Italy in the 14, 1500s. People would have these journal books and if the name journal entry, it's well named because it's a journal. If I don't, look, I'm, I don't keep a journal or a diary, some of you guys might, but that's what it is. It's just a listing of all the things which happened with that business that day and that week and that month. And it's just a list. But that list in itself is kind of useless. We want to be able to actually get something out of it. So each of these entries, we have debit account A, credit account B, 100, 100. We would have account A and account B. Account A is on the left-hand side, it's a debit. That goes to there. Account B is 100 credit. That goes to there. And then you would just simply work through each one and just put them all around. Oh no. That's all that we would be doing. But you can imagine when you have hundreds of these transactions a day, when you have thousands a day, that could take a while. And you needed to be really careful because you needed to make sure that everything went. And it wasn't like it was automatically computed. It wasn't even like they had calculators. They had to check this stuff really carefully. So. That's a process, it's obviously a lot easier now, it's automated, but we're gonna get you to do some of this by hand because we're going to. Um, so the T accounts are where everything gets accumulated. Um, the next few slides, we don't need to have a look at because um, it's actually easier if we just get into it. So this is an example of posting to the ledger. We've done this bit, debit, cash, credit, unearned, Revenue, debit, credit. This transaction, this entry, this line, debit 1350, cash 1350. Credit unearned rent revenue, 1350, 1350. Debit unearned rent revenue, 450. Credit rent revenue, 450. It's just working your way down the list. And I am going to do that for the entries we have. We've already talked about that. So the ledger is what we're about to do and have a look at. So we don't need that anymore. All right, I think there are 11 accounts, there might be 12, but we shall, we'll get through it. Um, that didn't take long to draw them up. And the way I'm gonna do this is to just follow the order of the transactions. Um, I wouldn't set it up, so I wouldn't do it debit cash, let's look for the next, next cash one. I would just work sequentially just down. You do it any other way, you're liable to miss something. So cash up here, capital. Um, in terms of how you order this stuff, it doesn't matter too much, but I would try where possible to keep assets together, liabilities together, equity together, revenues together, expenses together. It just makes finding stuff a little bit easier, but there's no real concern with how you do it. So working through the list, cash is debit 15,000. You don't need to put in a note ref, I mean, for our purposes, you probably don't need to put this in, but and can be really useful if you end up with a, with a range of different transactions going on that you're posting to check, to be able to follow back through where it came from. So debit cash, credit capital. Ugh, I've got that wrong already. Debit equipment. Uh, we'll call that 9,000. Debit supplies. Credit cash. Debit cash. Revenue.
debit cash, 2,000. Uh, credit unearned revenue, uh, let's put it up here. Debit advertising expense. Uh, we paid cash for it, so credit 250 cash. Debit account receivable. Uh, 3,500. Credit revenue, 3,500. Debit equipment, 9,000. Uh, note. Credit note payable is 9,000. Debit cash, 3,500. Uh, account receivable is 3,500. Debit wages expense, two thousand. Credit cash, two thousand. Debit dividends, fifteen hundred. And credit cash, fifteen hundred. All right. So what we've just done is did the journal entries, which are what's up on the sheet here. Once you've done them, you post them to the account, which is what I've just done. So we've got the 11 accounts. We've just put everything over. Absolutely fine. Like you're going to make errors here. It'll happen. It's not, look, it is what it is. But I'll be extremely upset if you make errors over there because that's literally just going, what account is it and do I go left or right? That's it. So this is one where you can get, you're nearly through. Um, so with that, that process, as you can see, it's an automatic process. Like it would just happen, once you put it in here, that would just get sucked up into that automatically. So you shouldn't be getting anything wrong there. Now, if it means you've got something wrong here, this will be wrong because it won't equal to what we've got, but that's fine. We generally, when we mark, we take that stuff into account. So whatever you put here has to go over there. If it's not, then that's just, Lazy is not the right word, but it should be spot on. Um, what we do at that point is we draw each of them off if we're getting into the end of the year or whenever we're sort of creating the statements. And we just create the balances. Now, the balance will go on the side. You, take, you sum up each side and the balance will go on the side. The net amount will go on the side, which is biggest. Um, and in most cases, that's pretty obvious where it goes. So capital is 15,000, credit, revenue is 5,000, credit, wages expense is 2,000, debit. Uh, what's that one? Advertising expense, 250, debit, unearned, 2,000, credit, notes payable, 9,000, credit, dividends, 1,500, debit, supplies, 1,000, equipment, 18,000, debit, Accounts receivable is a zero balance just because it's meant to have a debit balance. I'd put it zero under there. Cash, when you add up all this side and when you add up all that side, this side is bigger and it's bigger by $8,250. So what we've just done is create the balances for each of them. Now, there was a comment in the slides and you probably sort of come up across it elsewhere. They'll refer to what's called as the normal balance. The normal balance is the side of the account the account usually is. And that's also the side the account increases by. So a cash has a normal balance of a debit because generally speaking, 
your cash balance is either going to be zero or it's going to be positive. So either you have no cash or you're going to have some amount in there. Um, the same when you think about equipment. We've got $18,000 of equipment. We'll either have equipment or we won't. It'll either be there or it won't. So you don't have a negative. If you had a credit, a net credit balance for equipment, I don't even know what that means. It, it's a weird thing. So that's what the normal balance is. Um, what was I going to say? So that's working through getting those. So that's, that's that bit done. The trial balance, we've actually already looked at a trial balance, not that you knew it. Um, so once we get this information out, uh, the general ledger is a collection of T accounts, which is what we've just got here. Um, the trial balance is then listing all of these accounts. So what we're taking is all of that information. And we're just listing it out. That's all that the trial balance is doing. And it just means that we can make this stuff up more easily when we have to. Um, so let's have a look at how it looks. Making good time. All right. So the trial balance that we have from this is what's listed here. So we, all we've done is we've taken all the balances for all of these and we just put them in a list. That's it. So again, you don't have to think about that either. Cash, you just take the account name. It's an $8,250 debit balance. Cash at bank, $8,250 debit balance. That's it. Good practice is to keep assets together, liabilities together, equity together, revenue together, expenses together. And if you look through that, you can see that that's happening. Asset, asset, asset. Look, we haven't included account receivable, but you could. It doesn't change anything. Liability, liability. Relates to equity, relates to equity. Revenue, expense, expense. It's a general format that you'll see for creating child balances. Um, put all the various debits and credits in and what you end up with is a debit $31,000 balance of all the debit balances for these accounts and a credit $31,000 balance for all the credit balances with these accounts. And happily, that all balances. Now, that doesn't mean you're right though, which is problematic. What it means is if, it, if those two things don't add up and don't match off against each other, you're definitely wrong. 100% wrong. You need to check things. But if that, that's balanced, that doesn't mean we're correct. It just means you've made an equal error. It could mean you just made an equal error somewhere along the line. Once you've got that, once you've got that, we move into creating the financial statements. That's what we did earlier today. That question right there, question two from this morning or from earlier today, that, okay, it's not in a list and it's not using debits and credits, but that is a trial balance. And from that, we're just taking these amounts and putting them into financial statements. What we're doing here is gone debit and credit in the, in the accounts, put them in a trial balance here, revenue of 5,000, Revenue of 5,000, expense of 250, expense of 250, wages expense to 2,000, 2,000, net income 2,750. That we've done this before. Balance sheet, asset, 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 27,250. Liability, liability from the trial balance. You can see them just on the left there, 11,000, 16,250. Contributed equity is a 15,000 and retained earnings is from opening retained earnings plus net income minus dividends gives you closing retained earnings. We've done this. And you can see once you know, I'll roll this up a bit. As long as you know what the account types are, this just feeds in straight away. So again, I'll reiterate the point and it's such a crucial one, not just for the process, which is important, 
um, but also the understanding how the possible manipulations happen, how things can go wrong. This is the point. This is where things happen. That process all after it's automatic. But if you want to change an, an expense to an asset, that's where it happens. If you want to change the amount of something and you think it's going to be, you come up with a different amount for it, that's where it happens. This is such a crucial part of it. This is when the entry takes place. This is where human interaction into the system is involved. And where you have that involvement, it can be really good at times and it's good because computer logic can sometimes get stuffed up by complex situations like this, but it also leaves for the opportunity where people can play around with the outcomes. So the really big thing from an accounting I want you to take away, and a lot of people have this perception coming into accounting, is that it is a cut and dried, there is an answer and that's all it can be. What you'll see as you go further and further into it is that it's so much is open to judgment. Um, so that's an important thing to recognize with it. I've been talking for a long time. So yeah, there's good reasons to have trial balances because it all gets it in a place. What we will be doing next week, so we've been through this process, we've been through this process of posting to the account, we put it in a trial balance, we've made the accounting statements. Next week, in the first half of the day, this is why you need to prep for this stuff, we'll be getting you guys to do that. So there'll be unseen questions similar to today for you guys to do. And it's important, it's a good place to get practice at it and to get feedback on it because that way you can figure out what's working well, what's not. There's no marks in this room. It's good to make mistakes, but you've got to, you've got to set yourself up so you can be involved. Next week, we're going to look at the adjustments and the closing processes. Um, and there's some really interesting facets around that which we want to have a look at. Um, the final thing I've got to say is I will keep reading the papers and trying to find things which are, which are useful for us. I urge you to do the same. If you happen to come across something which you think is an interesting article, please bring it along and share it with the group because there is so much fascinating stuff going on out there. Um, it's useful to talk about it. On that note, that wraps us up. Um, I've got a bit of time now, so I'll be here for the next five or ten minutes or so if you've got any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll be downstairs from about three o'clock um, through to four o'clock if you have any others.